What's up guys, it's Fernando Cruz from Seller Tradecraft. I'm super excited for this video because today I'm gonna to be doing the complete guide to how to sell on Amazon, and especially in private label. It's a complete step-by-step -step guide. So we're gonna be covering all the basics so that by the end of this video, you guys should be comfortable with kind of the beginner aspects of selling on Amazon. So let's get started. So a little bit about us. Uh, we started selling on Amazon in 2015. I'm super proud to announce that we just hit the $1 million per month in sales. It took us about three and a half years. And just so you guys know, this is like the last like 30 days. So it's not even during Q4. We'd hit it before in like November, December, but this is the first time in a normal month uh, for us to actually hit it. So we've also sold over $30 million in private label products uh, over those three and a half years. And you know, one of the most rewarding parts of this business is that I've been able to help a ton of new and even some advanced sellers, you know, kind of build their business to the next level. So we've got about 30,000 people that are active Facebook members, as well as 12,000 YouTube subscribers. Thanks to all of you guys. And we've also been featured as experts and guest speakers at a bunch of the top Amazon conferences. So everything from the Elite Seller Summit to Accelerate, MDS Seller Summit, uh, AMPM podcast, you name it. If you guys aren't familiar with the Seller Tradecraft team, I'm in the middle, so my name is Fernando Cruz. This is the second eight-figure business that I've helped build. My expertise is really around product selection and scaling. Anthony's on the left, and what's crazy about Anthony is he built his first seven-figure business at 23. It's unbelievable. He's definitely one of, he's our expert in terms of product launching. And then Nick Young is on the right. He built his first eight figure business in the three and a half years with me. And yeah, he's also an expert in terms of product optimization, PPC, all that good stuff. Yeah, if you guys are curious about our stats, you guys can see it here. But yeah, you can see it at the bottom on the screenshot on the left. In the last 30 days, we've done over a million dollars in sales. And that's just one of our accounts. We have multiple, yeah, 55,000 units sold. And then on the right, you can see the screenshot from Seller Legend, which I'm super excited about. But yeah, our estimated profit just for the last 30 days was about $300,000. It's pretty crazy. Of course, we have you know our staff and every in office and things like that afterwards. But yeah, we definitely have a really healthy margin and everything else after PPC, the cost of our products, all that kind of stuff. So you know, a big reason why you guys are here is you guys want to be able to you know, run your own business, travel the world, all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to set the expectation like. Yeah, you guys can totally do that. Like the picture on the top left, you know, Nick and I set goals for the business. And when we hit those goals, we were able to get our own cars. And so I ended up ordering mine from Germany. So I got, uh, we went to the BMW factory in Munich, got to drive around and like road trip throughout Europe. It was amazing. Uh, I got to meet one of my heroes, Tim Ferriss, like in the top, top center. He was a huge inspiration in terms of, you know, like, us even like going and starting a business, especially when that was location independent because before we were in corporate. On the top right, I got to do running the bulls in Spain, which was a blast. On the bottom right, actually, we just got back from Ty Lopez's house where we were doing a project with them. I'm super excited to announce what's uh, gonna be coming pretty shortly. In the bottom middle, I actually went with my brother, I think maybe a year and a half ago, and we went to Tanzania to do Kilimanjaro, just the two of us. It was a great bonding trip for the two of us. And again, you know, we're running, like the business is running without me while I'm gone, which is so fun. And then the bottom left, actually in July, we just got back, but we were gone in me living in Mexico City for the entire month. I got to backpack, you know, through Mexico for a few weeks uh, with my girlfriend at the end. And yeah, I mean, this is totally doable when you're running a private label FBA business. So I wanted to explain a little bit why e-commerce is such a hot topic right now. And honestly, it's because of the growth rates. It's, it's just absolutely crazy. If you looked at you know, the overall uh, e-commerce market in 2014, it was doing about 1.3 trillion, which is you know, still an amazing amount of money. But you know, in 2017, just last year, it hit 2.3. By 2021, expected to grow to 4.5 trillion dollars. So it's almost like uh, actually it's more than tripling from in those seven years. Uh, so yeah, it's a 246% uh, percent growth rate. It's just out of control. And then yeah, in terms of there's still a really low market penetration. So only nine percent of all retail sales in the U.S is currently e-commerce and it's supposed to grow by 15% every single year. So it's still a great time to come in. There's still more and more people you know, signing up for Amazon Prime every single day. So it's a really, really exciting time. And let's face it, you know, uh, as, as sad as it is, retail is dying. You know, I grew up with Toys R Us. This is like where we went to get our presents. 
that's just not the case anymore. It, you know, they just went out filed for bankruptcy. I was actually reading some research papers. Apparently, there was about 4,000 stores that have closed as of maybe a few weeks ago, just this year, and only 2,000 have opened. And I'm sure you can like, you know, figure it out, but they're not the same chains. There are specific stores like Dollar General that are doing really, really well and they're opening stores while, you know, these other ones kind of like Toys R Us and you know, whatever, Kohl's, like those are ones not doing so well. So why Amazon? So it's the, one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world It represents about 50% of all online transactions for the US. That's psycho. So one out of two transactions. They got over a hundred million prime members and 300 in 10 million active customers worldwide. They're at least 10 years ahead of every other online marketplace or e-commerce company. They've invested a ton in their infrastructure, which they were heavily criticized for a long time, but it was the most genius move because the fulfillment by Amazon program basically allows pretty much any product, like unless it's like super massive, to get delivered in two days. And basically what they did was they trained every single Prime member to expect two-day shipping. And so it's really, really hard for other companies to compete because they don't have that same infrastructure. And it's expected by 2022 that Amazon will represent 9% of all retail sales, both online and offline, just Amazon alone. That's crazy. So yeah, they've got 13 countries that they're expanding to. So it's a great, great time. Like, yeah, for sure the US is a little bit more competitive, but you know, they have Japan now, they have Mexico, Canada, the EU, you name it. There's just so much opportunity on Amazon right now. So uh, I wanna go through this quickly. I mean, I already mentioned there's 100 million Prime members, which is crazy. But when you think about it, like just to give you guys a little bit of perspective. So Amazon is also the new Google for product search. And that's amazing. So about 50% of online searches when you're looking for a product happen on Amazon. And so when you're searching on Amazon, you also have buying intent. So that's why the conversion rates are so high relative to other platforms. On top of that, you know, a lot of people expect, and I did too, so like, don't feel bad, is that Amazon actually sells all the products, which is not true. About 50% is actually sold by third party marketplace sellers, just like you and me. And then, so a lot of people are like, okay, well, those third party marketplace sellers, they're probably huge, massive companies. And that's actually also not true because there's like, there's, you know, regular people like, you know, selling from their home or traveling the world, selling, you know, from their laptop, but there's over 140,000 sellers now that surpassed a hundred thousand dollars in sales just last year. So let me repeat that. So 140,000 people, like just normal sellers, have surpassed $100,000 in sales just on Amazon alone. So that's if you're not selling on eBay, Walmart, your own website, whatever, just on Amazon, $100,000 in sales. It's really, really crazy. So yeah, I mean, I briefly touched upon this, but the FBA program or fulfilled by Amazon is huge. It's their kind of, I'm not secret sauce anymore, but it's their ability to ship any product for the most part to the customer within two days. They've got about a 140 fulfillment centers now scattered across the world. But the awesome thing is that, you know, from, from the research that we've done, if your product is now, you know, prime eligible, it can increase sales up to 3x, which is crazy. So, and then, you know, bringing it back to like the consumer, why do people decide to buy things on Amazon? And honestly, it's because of convenience and trust. Like they've got 200 million unique visitors per month. They got the super fast shipping time. They've got amazing customer support. They've got, um, and that's why, you know, so many people uh, start their search there. And, you know, a bunch of people are purchasing mobile. They're, they're constantly improving their mobile experience. They've got the one click checkout. But on top of that, they, you've already, they've trained, uh, they've been trained to buy on Amazon. Their credit card is saved. There's a lot of trust. The interface has really, really been designed to make sure that it's like very, very seamless. And that's what you want. It's like, I, I hate going to a new website, like a, let's say a new Shopify store. I have to enter in all my details. I have to start getting more emails, like you know, entering my credit card information, all that kind of stuff. Then I have to wait a week. All that kind of stuff is really not convenient relative to buying things on Amazon. I know a ton of my friends would actually rather pay more for a product that's on Amazon than buying it specifically on that website. And yes, yeah, so they have a ton of loyalty programs. So they got like Amazon, you know, video, they've got the music streaming, they've got like tons and stuff uh, that's all constantly coming out because they're really trying to make sure to lock people in 
um, into that hundred dollars a year membership. So, you know, when you start really considering like, okay, well, what are the other options for e-commerce? And I wanted to make sure that we really clarify this. So it's basically pretty much Shopify and an FBA, like Walmart and eBay are, I don't even know how many years behind, but when you think about a Shopify site, these are the things that you have to figure out how to do and profitable. You have to you know, do website development. So you have to build your own website and you have to optimize it. You have to learn how to generate external traffic, which is hard to do. You have to figure out how to optimize your conversion rate. So on average, according to the research, it's about a little over 3%. For, so if you get 100 people coming to your website, only 3.3 will actually buy. Then you have to figure out your warehousing and fulfillment. So you could use a 3PM but it's gonna be still a lot more expensive than Amazon because it doesn't have the same scale. But when you think about it, yes, yeah, so you, you have to deal with that. You have to, you know, if you get your own warehouse, you have to think about warehouse employees, all that kind of stuff. You also have to uh, build trust. So you have to figure out your payment processor. You need to make sure that you have a good relationship with them. You know, you have to get, and you have to get the, uh, the consumer to also trust you and your brand and everything else. You have to provide customer support to those people, let them know like, you know, their tracking codes and if things are you know delayed, all that kind of stuff. And then basically you're kind of location dependent because of that warehouse, unless you go with a 3PL. So that one's kind of a iffy, but then let's look at FBA in comparison. So there's no development at all necessary because Amazon has already designed the website and already optimized it for us. They've got a $310 million uh, customer base, which is crazy. So you don't have to worry about driving external traffic. The average conversion rate is almost four times higher. So it's 13%. On top of that, you're, you're definitely uh, winning if you're using their FBA program because their shipping rates are cheaper. And then you don't have to have a warehouse and a fulfillment team, all those kind of um, fixed costs. Instead, you're moving them to a variable cost, which is way better. There's a lot of implicit trust just because of the reviews, which is that kind of social, that, that social currency that basically helps customers uh, trust your listing. Uh, and then on top of that, they handle a majority of the customer support for you. And really it's a location independent business if you want it to be, which is awesome. So. Um, yeah, selling on Amazon is really a proven, repeatable formula, you know, and private label is about finding like existing demand for a niche and just applying it better. So offering more value or differentiating it, finding another way uh, to just not do a me too product. So with our steps, you can totally dominate a niche and then build a long lasting, sustainable brand. And the awesome thing about Amazon infrastructure is it gives you the ultimate leverage into, you know, pretending to be like a hundred million dollar company when you're just starting out and being able to deliver your product anywhere to anyone. And I think that one of the best things also is that a lot of the work is upfront. So this can totally be a passive business if you guys decide that's what you want to do. It's not what we've decided to do. I mean, we've definitely taken a step back and, you know, in working on new projects and everything else. But overall, this is something that you can kind of, you know, create the listing, get the product rank, and then you're really just kind of checking in on the listings every so often and reordering inventory, which is the best part. So there's kind of five different steps to the private label process. And I wanted to cover these quickly for you guys. So the first one is product selection and product selection is super, super important because it really makes everything else easier. It's kind of the first domino when you think about it. Number two is sourcing the supply chain. So uh, working with your manufacturers and basically getting those uh, products produced and then sent to the US or wherever you're selling them. Uh, you have the pre-launch module, so it's kind of what you're working on uh, before the uh, while the product is being produced and while it's being shipped to your destination country. And you have number four, which is the product launch phase. So making sure that your product is at the top of Amazon, not on page five or page 10, where no one's gonna find it. And then number five is the post-launch optimization. So basically everything that you have to do after it's been launched, just to make sure that you stay relevant, you stay on top of it, and you continue getting those passive sales. So product selection. So I wanted to start off with this slide because I think it's super, super important. And I wanna make sure that everyone else is on the same page. So forget about revenue. Like it's honestly, it's a vanity metric. That's where everyone starts and everyone talks about. And yeah, revenue is important, but overall, like your contribution margin is way, way more important. And so I want to make sure that you guys understand this because not enough people understand these metrics. So if you look at the image on the bottom left, so revenue and, uh, is like obviously your sales. If you subtract out all the variable costs, 
then you're gonna be left with your fixed costs and your profit. And that's basically your contribution margin. And so you might be asking, okay, well, what's a variable cost? A variable cost is anything that it only happens every time you do a sale. So like, you know, uh, the cost of the product, like you only report that on your, like, uh, on your income statement every time you have a sale. Or, you know, uh, shipping from Amazon's FBA program to the customer, that only happens every time you have a sale. So those are all the variable costs. And then so, um, you know, the example on the right is hopefully helpful for you guys in terms of getting like a bigger picture of like how these margins work. So let's say the, the product cost is $100. So that's, or sorry, in terms of uh, the sale price. So that's how much we're selling it for. And then our cost of good landed, so COGL, is let's say $24. So that means the cost of the product plus getting it shipped to the US for this example would be a total of $24. Uh, the referral fees is a cost that we pay to Amazon for having the transaction happen on their marketplace. It covers their credit card fees, their marketing, whatever. It's, you know, it's obviously a huge profit driver for them. For most categories, it's 15%. So we're gonna use that as a default. So it's $15 on the $100 item. The FBA fees, again, is the shipping from the FBA's uh, program to the end customer so that you're never having to see it, that's $13. Uh, on top of that, so we're gonna be using Amazon's FBA program to store all of our products. So we budget around three to 4%. Just to be conservative, we're using 4%, just so you know. And then the last thing is ad spend. So again, this is variable, but this, or, and it, it can be estimated across our you know 300 products, we usually see it around seven to 8%. So again, we're gonna be a little bit conservative. We're gonna put $8. So when you're selling this $100 item, that means your all your variable expenses are gonna be around $64, which leaves a contribution margin of $36, also 36%. So hopefully that gives you guys an idea of like the numbers that I really care about in, um, in my business. And so the last one is like ROI. So, ROI is a, um, a really easy calculation. You take your contribution margin, so the $36, and then you divide that by your cost of good landing, so the $24. So uh, you get an ROI of about 150%. So uh, for us, we're, when we're looking at products, we will not do a product that's below 150% ROI. Completely different uh, you know, in every business, but for us, that we think that the margins are super important. And so that's a really uh, pivotal, it's a really crucial part of our criteria. And we've developed six criteria that we use when we're looking at products, but that's just one of them that I wanted to share with you guys. So next is the best seller rank. Super, super important. Basically every product in, in every single category is ranked against each other. So forget about the subcategories. Like, you know, here, if you look at the rice cookers, that is the subcategory but kitchen and dining is the larger category. And so every product in the larger category, like kitchen and dining, is ranked against each other in terms of volume and units. So this is actually the Instapot, which sells more units than any other product in the kitchen and dining category. And so, you know, number two is second, three is, you know, the third, and it kind of just goes down from there. So the lower the number, the better. And so you, it's important to note that, you know, not every category is created equal. Uh, equally. So for instance, home and kitchen, there's a lot more volume as a category than industrial and scientific. Just more people are buying things for the home. That makes sense. But yeah, this, these numbers are constantly changing. So if you do a promotion, let's say for 500 units yesterday, your BSR will be higher um, today than it actually is normalized. So it's important to track this over time and get a better understanding. But the reason that I'm sharing this with you guys, this is the best way to estimate sales on Amazon. That's what everyone uses is the BSR because we know that like the kind of relative ranks and then within each category. And this is how we estimate our number or uh, we, this is how we estimate the monthly number of units that get sold. So there's three top tools uh, within the Amazon industry that help you with product selection. So the three are Viral Launch, Jungle Scout, and Helium 10. In no particular order, I just listed them here. So Back in the day, what you would have to do is you you know find a specific niche. You click on the search page, 
you start opening up a bunch of tabs. Then you have to scroll down, find their BSR, kind of understand what the BSR is for that specific category, and then decide if it's a product that you want to go into or not. There's also the 999 trick, which is you like try to buy all the inventory. Amazon will give you an error message and then say like, oh, there's you know 200 left. And then the next day you could go back at the same time and see, oh, there's 150 left. So they sold 50 units in that day. It's honestly a huge waste of time, not the best way of going about it. But these tools have built massive databases, which are super, super helpful in terms of giving you a quick snapshot of how that product, again, is doing at this point in time. Very similar to like a balance sheet. So you can basically export. And the awesome thing is that it brings everything into a super easy to uh, view screen. So I can see all the average you know, price points, I can see the monthly sales, I can see all of, like how many reviews they all have, I can see like, and there's a lot of other criteria too, like you know, who's shipping the product, is it you know, vendor central, is it seller central, what's the review rating, what's the weight, you know, sales to review ratio, there's a ton of stuff. But this makes it super, super easy to pull that information for you. You can export it, you can, um, and then you can filter it, you can do whatever you want. But yeah, it's huge uh, in terms of saving you time, which is really, really important. Jungle Scout, from my understanding, is the cheapest. It's like a one-time payment, which is cool. Helium 10 is also great because it comes with like a whole suite of tools that's important to know. Uh, but overall, these are my three favorite tools for this. So let's go into some of the categories. So I call these the headache category. These ones are a lot tougher to get into just because they're higher volume and then that means that the sellers that end up going there are usually more sophisticated. So I would not really recommend this for probably your first or second product, but after that, it's fair game. I think it's totally worth going into. So supplements, health and personal care, obviously these are like super high volume, so really competitive. Cell phone accessories, electronics, I also include here specifically because it's really competitive, but on top of that, there's a lot of moving pieces. You know, you can have higher return rates or high defect rates, which is really scary if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and then beauty and topicals. There's a lot of restrictions around that kind of stuff. So I like to tell people, look where other people are not. So do the categories that are not as sexy and not as, the like, you know, I, I hear a ton of people say like, oh, just walk around your home and look at what items you have and think about selling one of those. And I feel like that's honestly kind of terrible advice because everyone's kind of doing that. And so you're going to get the same results. Those same niches are going to get, uh, you know, really saturated. Like frying pans are overdone and that's an easy product to find at home. But so I, I like to think uh, a little bit more outside of the box. So industrial and scientific or office products or pet. Not everybody has a pet. Not everybody has a baby. So like those products are not necessarily immediately top of mind for everyone. And so a limited, a more limited amount of sellers are going to go after those. So those are some like kind of de uh, in descending order. Those are kind of my favorite categories. So there's also a few categories that require ungating. So I thought I'd kind of highlight those for you. But they're grocery, health and personal care and beauty. This list does change often. So I included this link below so that you guys can get the most updated list from Amazon. It's not that huge of a deal. You can pay about $300 for some ungating service to open up your account. Uh, but just so you know, it does require proof of purchase in, um, and invoices. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's just an extra step, but in a way that is good because it's another barrier to entry. So retail price. So we go after 15 to $50 price points. And just so you guys know, this is the second criteria of my six. And there's a few reasons for that. I like products that are in the impulse purchase range. So, you know, less than let's say $50. And that's why the, uh, the ceiling is at $50. Above that, you know, $100, $200 items, like they're gonna do a lot more research. They're gonna try to figure out if you're a brand. And, you know, it's just, it's a more material purchase for a lot of people. But I cut it off at $15 on the, on the floor. And there's a bunch of reasons why is that you need to have enough margin, which we covered earlier, in case, you know, other people come in and then there's margin compression because people, you know, want to be at the top, so they start lowering their price, which is, you know, what we call margin compression. So if you get, uh, if you start at $15, you get a little bit of wiggle room to maybe 12 before you decide to like discontinue the product. There's also, it gives you room for PPC, it gives you room for giveaways. And for all those reasons, this is the range of our retail price that we prefer. So this is a funny product to me. This was actually recommended as like the perfect product by a bunch of gurus when we first started. And because it fit a lot of these criteria, you know, it's kind of light, small, you know, it fits in a shoe box, it's not breakable. And so it ended up being one of the first few products that we ended up launching and it was the worst. It was a terrible experience. 
Uh, and there's a bunch of reasons why. Like one, there's a ton of different comparables. You know, you can use like a dish uh, towel. You can use like a bunch of other stuff in lieu of these silicone gloves. But on top of that, it's, everyone's got the same thing. Yeah, they have different colors, but it's basically the same product. And then on top of that, they've got hundreds, if not thousands of reviews. Like Amazon's coming in here at $3.26. Like how are you gonna compete with that? And so overall, I think what you know, a lot of gurus like are kind of explaining in terms of how they choose products, it's honestly, it's really not good advice. And so a lot of the time they're gonna say like, oh yeah, well, all you have to do is kind of just blast to the top, you know, just do 90% giveaway, blast a thousand units in one day, and then you'll be at the top and you'll make a ton of money. And honestly, that's terrible, terrible advice. It's super expensive to do. And here's like, let me cover this. So there's three reasons why that's honestly just terrible. Number one is that you're basically gambling because like what happens if for whatever reason you don't land on the top of page one? Like, yeah, you might, but it's just really not worth it. You're spending so much money in terms of like the cost of the promotion, like the FBA fees and like, you know, the referral fees and the cost of the product. It's just a, a huge investment, especially for someone starting out. Number two is that it requires a ton of inventory to be able to do that giver giveaway. So you're not really testing that first product. That means you're kind of going a lot bigger the first time before you even know if it's going to sell well. And then number three, yeah, like I mentioned, is you're going to lose a ton of money on that giveaway. And yeah, overall, if you're just starting out, I really do not recommend doing that as your first product. There's countless ad stories where I see people, they end up having to liquidate a ton of inventory. They're kind of like, you know, they're, they're stuck. They're probably going to give up selling on Amazon afterwards. And so I really, really recommend um, not going on approach. And so I wanted to share with you guys some better products that I think uh, are much more feasible and a way better opportunity for you guys just starting out. So this screen printing frame. So I'm like, I'm honestly surprised I'm sharing this because I, honestly, I would do this product in our own business, but it's a really good example and I figured I would just share it. And so there's a bunch of reasons why I love this product. So number one, is that no one thinks to sell this product unless you're like in the screen printing business or like you're really into DIY kind of stuff. Like it's not something that most people have laying around their house, but it still has great volume. Number two is that it doesn't fit in a shoebox. So for all of you all that listen to everyone else out there that's looking for these like really tiny, you know, high price point items, like they're not gonna wanna do this product because they're like, oh, it's too big. So way less people are gonna do it. You're gonna face way less margin compression in the long run. And number three is this product is actually made in the US. And let's face it, like it's more expensive to produce things in the United States. So I know that I can definitely improve the margins a lot by buying this in China. Here's a John Scow export uh, or screenshot of this category. And look at this. So the first listing in Speedball, which is a brand, is doing about 27,000 with 264 reviews. Pretty good. But next is Jacquard. They're doing $20,000 in revenue with only 35 reviews. Skip down one, uh, and then the next one is a six pack of these guys. 11,000 with eight reviews. It's crazy. Like this is the kind of niche that I love. Like the average number of reviews is really low. The competition isn't that sophisticated. Overall, it's a great category. And so, so this is kind of the stuff that we look for when we're doing it, product selection. And I wanted to cover over bundling and that concept just to make sure that you guys are aware of it. So bundling is you know pretty self-explanatory. You bundle with a complementary product. It increases the perceived value, which is really important. Uh, it makes it harder to replicate, which is cool. It, you're less likely to get margin compression just because less people are gonna be willing to find those two products and put them together. But overall, it's like lowering your FBA fees as a percentage usually because if you're shipping two items separately, then you're having to pay the FBA fees you know, the pick and pack fees and stuff like that separately. But if they're in the same unit, like that's getting shipped together, then you're gonna pay less FBA fees than if they were separate. And so it gives you kind of a competitive advantage in terms of margin. And then so you can, you can actually give a little bit of a discount than if it was sold separately. But on top of that, you're making more margin. And so let me go through some examples of that. So bundling example number one. So we saw, you know, the, uh, the screen printing frame, which you guys understand now but you can see the frequently bought together section below. And so this is a great area to look for specific products that are gonna do well because Amazon's actually telling you, hey, people actually buy these products together. 
So the one that's kind of hard to see in um, in the image is the white ink, I think. I think it's white. But anyways, it's it's ink, you know, made for the screen printing frame. So actually that jacquard listing that I brought up earlier, they're actually doing that. So it's, you know, a little set of ink with a screen printing frame and some little slidey thing. I don't know what it does. But yeah, these guys are doing almost $9,000 in revenue with only 41 reviews. Not bad. So this is a great example of really intuitive bundling for things that make sense. Like if you do, I don't know, going back to this frying pan, if you do a frying pan with like a plate, I don't think that's necessarily gonna be the best idea, but this actually really makes sense. And then another great example that I really love is this battery pack with a cell phone, like an iPhone cable. So if you were to go into each one of these categories you know, separately, I would be like, you're freaking crazy. These are super competitive. I would do these. But what's really brilliant about what they did is they brought it together because they know like, hey, if I'm gonna buy a battery pack, then I'm probably gonna wanna keep an iPhone cable with it. So I might as well just buy one with it. And so that's what they did. And you can look at the results below, but these guys are doing like, the, so the second listing is not actually this, this exact product, but they're doing one listing with 20,000 uh, revenue, one with 3,000 and one with 9,000. All of them have less than 200 reviews. But yeah, phenomenal example of bundling and one that I really appreciate. I thought it was a really smart move. Okay, so the monopoly method. So this is a strategy that I developed and it's really helped us uh, multiply our profits to three, 10, sometimes even 20, 30 products. And it's a really great way to take over more market share. And so one of the best companies at this is Kleenex. So if you search tissues in Amazon, they've, comp uh, they've created a bunch of different listings with a bunch of different ways to merchandise. They have different quantity packs, they have different like size boxes, maybe some with aloe, I don't really know, but when you count it out, when you search tissues, there's 16 top spots. What's crazy is that Kleenex has 10 of them. So it's around like 60% of the top sales is going to them. But on top of that, they have like the number one, two, and three spot at the top. So these guys are absolutely crushing it and they really nail the monopoly method. So it's just basically coming up with different uh, variations, different ways of merchandising uh, your products and then basically getting them all to the top so that you're taking up more real estate. And it basically uh, prevents other competitors from wanting to come in uh, and that's huge. And so yeah, I definitely recommend that um, when you're considering uh, you know, expanding and trying to drive up the profitability uh, by niche. Okay, so let's go into sourcing supply chain. So you found your list of products that you're gonna go after, and now you're gonna start trying to get pricing from your manufacturers and then get those items shipped to the US. So here's the kind of uh, the quick overview of everything that you need to, to understand to get your product into Amazon. So you have the sourcing fundamentals, so it's some, some of the key terms. You've got your setup uh, in terms of like technology, you're gonna do your initial contact or reaching out to your manufacturers, you're gonna get samples, you're gonna decide on a manufacturer, you're gonna negotiate, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna set up the packaging, you're gonna do your purchase invoice or your, uh, your PI, you're gonna do the review of that, you're gonna get your actual purchase order, you're gonna go through production, you're gonna go through the labels, setting them labels like Amazon labels so that your products can go directly to Amazon, you're gonna need, and get an inspection before you actually pay the re remaining balance, which is usually 70%, just to make sure that the goods are good. The goods are what they said they would be. You're gonna arrange the logistics, so getting them to your warehouse, and then they're on the way. Oh, I kind of forgot to mention, there's a deposit. So when you get the purchase order, you place a deposit to start the production. Usually that's a 30% deposit. But yeah, so let's go into the terms. Okay, so there's a minimum order quantity, which is your MOQ. And so this is a really often used term. Sometimes it's negotiable, but this is, yeah, basically the minimum number of units that you need to order to start production with your manufacturer. Sometimes there's kind of workarounds, like let's say they're asking for a thousand, but you only want to do 500. You can kind of come up with some creative strategies saying like, oh, how about we do 500, but for two different colors. So like one red, one blue. So you come up to a total of a thousand and that way you're testing two products instead of just one. Another way of working around it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we've done it before. But it's, you can try using the line like, oh, this is a small order because it's specifically a quality assurance test or a quality control test. But afterwards, we're gonna be ordering 5,000 or whatever. So uh, just kind of to give you that brief background. Next is the lead time. 
So this one's you know pretty self-explanatory also, but it's just the lead time between the initiation, so when you place a deposit, to when the goods are finished. And so things to, uh, to mention is like sometimes they'll say 30 days, but does that mean calendar days or does that mean working days? And if they mean working days, like how many days a week do they work? Some factors will work five days, six days, or even seven days a week. So it's important just to get that kind of understanding. And another pro tip is that you should really be careful because lead times can extend around the Chinese holidays, Q4, or any busy season, like uh, seasonal time. Like if they're doing, let's say, swimsuits leading up to summer is probably going to be kind of crazy. So it definitely can be extended. So you make sure to plan ahead. And then so Alibaba. So Alibaba is where we go uh, to find all of our manufacturers. Uh, basically, it's a huge directory of, uh, of factories, a lot in China, but even some now outside. And so some of the things that we're going to be looking for is gold suppliers, which means it's, it's kind of like our Better Business Bureau, but it means that they have a stamp of approval from Alibaba um, and they pay a yearly fee to basically maintain that. It's about $2,000 a year, I think. But we're looking for factories that have transaction history, so they're actually getting deals done. And then the third thing you want to like kind of have a better understanding is, you know, the difference between a trading company and a manufacturer. So a manufacturer, you know, makes their own products, pretty self-explanatory. Trading company is kind of a broker that represents a ton of different manufacturers and they're just trying to, you know, kind of wheel and deal. They're going to like, they're going to reach out to maybe three different manufacturers based on the product that you're looking for. They're going to find the best price. They're going to market up some or get paid by the manufacturer some and then, and then resell it to you at a little bit higher cost. So often when you're looking at names of the companies, you're going to see like trade or trading in there just so you know. So again, these are some examples. Like if it were me, I would like the one at the top of the best. It's got nine years, so it's been on, uh, on Alibaba for a long time. But they've got $150,000 in transactions through the platform, uh, which is important. I'm sure way more off the platform. They've got a high response rate, all that kind of stuff, which is probably where they're showing them at the top. The next is you know uh, the 14-year one, which has a lot less transactions. The response rate is a little bit slower. And there's the last one. It's only been on there for a one year. doesn't have as many transactions, all that kind of stuff. So... Communication tips. So this one's a big one. So if you start reaching out to manufacturers, you're going to get completely bombarded with messages. There's just no question about it. So I usually recommend setting up a different Gmail uh, and or you can use any email service that you prefer. But Gmail, I really love. There's like, you know, cool label features and all that kind of stuff, which makes it really easy. But use that when you're reaching out, when you're signing up for your Alibaba. Um, so that way your work email or your personal email is not getting just bombarded with these messages. I'm also going to recommend that you guys download WeChat and Skype. Those are the like the most commonly used uh, communication platforms. If you're trying to move fast, WeChat is the best. It, like everybody in China has it because it's kind of like an all-in-one app for China. Like everything that you would need, so it's going to go directly to their phone, like a text message would. So it's a really great messenger app. Skype is a little bit hit or miss. Like their response rate is not as quick, but again, it's a great way to get in touch, and it seems to be better than email. You can kind of go, you can just chat and get things done way faster. So when you're doing an initial request, uh, you want to be as detailed as possible. So make sure you're including every little criteria or aspect of the product so that you can reduce the back and forth. So, you know, material, the dimensions, the weight that you're looking for, packaging or the type of packaging, you want color packaging or just a brown box, the quantity, colors, all of that kind of stuff, make sure to include that in the, in the initial outreach. Because again, you're, there's a lot of language barrier. You're having to be to messaging these people during our evenings usually. So you want to try to minimize that back and forth and be super, super detailed. So sample cost. This one I get asked all the time. So I want to just create its own slide just to make sure to like, emphasize this. Sample costs are totally normal. They usually, for cheaper products, will not charge you for the actual product. But, but most of the cost is actually due to the express shipping to, to us. So I usually expect it to be around 30 to $60. We'll pay up to $200, but usually we prefer it to be in the 30 to $60 range. But if you're getting something a little bit more complicated, I would definitely expect the sample cost to be a little bit more expensive, especially if you're asking for like a, you know, a custom sample. So we usually don't, but you know, it's completely up to you. So here's some tips that I wanted to include to hopefully help you guys. So number one is you should ask for a photo or a video. Video is better of the sample before you actually send it. And so in the beginning, we were not doing this. And then all the time we would get the like 
completely the wrong product. The manufacturer thought I was the same or they were just trying to get the sale. And so we ended up paying all these like shipping fees or uh, our sample costs for products that we, if we had just gotten a picture of, we know we wouldn't have done. And so that's super, super important. Uh, get those um, photos and videos approved before you uh, send them payment for the sample. And then if there's different versions that you're looking at, then make sure that they include them all in the, in the first shipment. So to save you time and money, because again, the phrase is the bigger component of the cost. I'll also ask for sample packaging and a catalog to be included just to have for our reference. And then lastly, is make sure to save the tracking numbers uh, in case they don't include a business card. Um, you don't need to save them if they do include a business card, but surprisingly, a lot of the time they don't. And then like, our little method just to help you is like, you know, we'll take the business card to the sample so that we have it kind of organized. And then, yeah, like a pro tip, like, uh, it's actually telling them to include the business card with the sample because it just ends up being a lot more clear. So payments. So this one, uh, there's a ton of different options. So I wanted to kind of go over these quickly with you guys. So PayPal is usually what we'll use for small samples. Um, we, we usually do not use it for like the larger transactions because they don't want to take the PayPal fees. Uh, wire transfers are usually the best way to get like the actual productions uh, started or finished. So like the balance and deposits. We personally use Comerica. Uh, we have like a treasury management service, which allows us to send like unlimited wires. Uh, it costs us $20 and then it's $26 per wire. Um, but the nice thing is we get a little token so we can do it from anywhere. Before in the beginning, I was actually going to the bank each time and then wiring it, which was a huge waste of time. Um, I do know Chase has some different programs out there with like two or four free wires. So it's definitely worth looking into. Uh, Wells Fargo has a similar program to Comerica, um, but there was other things that were kind of annoying about them. So we switched to Comerica. Uh, Alibaba trade insurance is cool. It's kind of like a verified payment service through the platform so that uh, you have a little, you can sleep a little bit better at night just knowing that if something were to go wrong and you were to let's say get cheated by your supplier for whatever reason, then they've got, uh, they can intervene and kind of have that money in escrow. Uh, and overall, I should just make a quick disclaimer. Like we've only had like a problems, a, you know, a handful of times out of the 300 different products that we've launched. So overall, I feel like we've had a really, really good experience working with China. There's for sure cultural barriers, but overall we've had a really good experience. And the last one is Veeam. So Veeam is a new one that I really love. It's worked really, really well for us. And basically they use kind of some crypto stuff to send the payments for really cheap. But basically if you're sending something to, to overseas and they accept in US dollars, you pay nothing, but they pay a $20 uh, transaction fee. So it's great for us. We, we were paying, I don't know, maybe $1,500 before a month in wire fees, which went down pretty much to zero since we started using Veeam. It's another great way to pay your contractors. So if you guys start building out your teams, it's also used for that as well. So inspections. So now you have your products produced. They're about to be finished. And so now you want to hire an inspection company to kind of come in and make sure that the quality is good, that like the, the manufacturer made the product that they said they would. And this is huge, guys. Like this costs maybe $100 per person per day. They'll usually do about 150 samples in that day. They'll just choose randomly and then inspect them. I cannot emphasize this enough. You need to do this because, you know, you can actually get the product fixed and replaced while it's in China. But once you get it here, you pay a ton of money in freight and it's way harder to like, kind of get them, the, the manufacturer to do anything at that point. So I really recommend getting it inspected in China. And that way they're going to take the quality seriously. If they don't pass for whatever reason, they'll replace those units, all that kind of stuff. Some factories, for whatever reason, do not want inspection companies to visit their factories. That's a huge red flag. I would never work with a company like that. And yeah, like I mentioned, the freight can be more expensive than the product itself, depending. So it's really, really important um, that you don't waste that freight expense uh, by sending about a product to the U.S. Uh, and then, so yeah. So you know your comp uh, your products passed the inspection, and now you need to think about how you're going to get these shipped uh, to the U.S. So there's kind of basically two like overall big categories: there's air shipments and sea shipments. So air can take 18 to 20 days door to door usually. So like door to door is like the factory to Amazon's facilities. If you do sea, it's usually around 40 days. But 
you know, you pay for convenience. So the air is going to cost three to five times more than C usually. The costs are determined a little bit differently. So for air, it's dimensions of weight versus C, it's just dimensions. And then the packing is a little bit different as well. So you guys know, uh, loose cartons is just boxes, you know, not tied to anything. Palletized is on a pallet, you know, stretch wrapped usually. And then uh, LCL is less than a container load. FCL is a full container load and there's a bunch of things around that. Cool, so we finished with sourcing supply chain. Now, while the products are being produced and you know being shipped to the US, you've got a pretty big window usually uh, where you can start preparing to get these products uh, ready to be listed on Amazon. And so we're gonna go through these quickly for all the things that you need to do um, you know, during that kind of downtime. So there's four major areas to the pre-launch section. So there's branding, photography, keyword research, and copywriting. So, branding. So this one is a big debate. A lot of people think that branding is super, super important and they really care about their branding. A lot of people do not care on Amazon. I'm more in the second camp where I do not think that Amazon customers truly are super, um, you know, I don't think their decision making is super made by like, you know, their, that brand. If they have a good experience with that brand the first time, then yeah, they're way more likely to buy it the second time. But I don't think that it's one that I would spend a ton of money on personally. So, and a lot of the time, like, you know, the branding, you might not even include it in your main image. It really just depends. Some product niches, they do better with packaging, including the images. Sometimes they don't. But for the most part, a lot of the customers are not going to see the branding until they've already made the purchase. And then just due to the history of return rates, it's usually pretty low. I mean, if you have like the most hideous packaging ever, then like, yeah, maybe, but overall it's not usually an, uh, an issue. And then so for us, we'll usually go to, uh, to get packaging done on Fiverr. You know, you're gonna get the, um, the template for the packaging from your manufacturer, send it over, send like, you know, maybe some ideas, some colors that you wanna use, all that kind of stuff. But you will usually have people on Fiverr do it uh, before we ended up building out our internal team that does it for us. And then uh, marketing insert, marketing inserts. So this is a big one. Um, so you can kind of tell a little bit of your brand story and it's a great way to actually uh, provide a support email so that people can reach out to you uh, if they have questions or if they're having a negative experience or something broke or whatever. So I think that's a great way of just saying like, hey, if you're not happy for whatever reason, hit us up at you know, support at you know, abcproducts.com. And then number two is that you can actually use that opportunity to try to get them onto a marketing list. So you can send them to a landing page that you know captures their email, and then you can use that audience for remarketing. We'll usually kind of advertise it as like a VIP customer list or something like that. And then overall, that's like valuable. You can use that to launch future products. You can use that um, to build Facebook audiences. There's a ton of different things that you can do. So I definitely recommend including an insert in every single product that you do. So next is photography. So I think this is definitely one of the most important aspects of getting sales on your listing. You know, over the 300 products that we've done, we've seen that images can impact conversions by at least 30%. It's crazy. And like, when you think about it, like when you type in a product, let's say tissues to the search results, then you see very little information on that front page. It's just basically like price, the number of reviews and the images. And so the images like hold a huge factor when you think about it, uh, because it's, it's harder to control the number of reviews you have you know, you, you're kind of restricted to a range of like what price you can sell at based on your margins, but your images are fully in your control and making sure that they're the best optimized uh, listed or images that are Amazon compliant. And so let's just break down the, the different types of images. There's the primary image, so the, the default image, and then there's also the secondary image. So of course the primary is the one that's default shown in the search results. It's the one uh, that gets shown when you're doing PPC it's by far the most important image. So you want that one to be on the white background. You want that to be the highest converting one. So we'll use tools like Splitly to help test that. And then secondary images usually have a little bit of a different strategy. The primary, you're trying to get people to click on your listing. The secondary, you're trying to increase your conversion rate. So you wanna answer all of the questions that your customer has through your imagery. 
And like, you know, one of the things that we really believe is that your images should sell the product without even needing to read the copy because it explains everything. And that's like a good use of that is like infographics that include like the dimensions and the features and the benefits and, and truthfully like what it's like to own that product. You can have lifestyle images, which is people actually like, you know, models like using that product and being like, oh, you know, like if I wear these yoga pants, I'm going to look like her, that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> that's kind of ridiculous. But uh, yeah, that's uh, what you want to do with your images. So here's some of the examples of the primary images that we wanted to show you guys. And you can see how they kind of stand out. Um, like the one, the sponsored one on the top left, like it's not really that exciting. Like the one quart food grade, like uh, safe round container. It's not that cool. But like, I think the, um, the one on the top right is a lot nicer. It's got food in it. You kind of, kind of imagine what it's like to be using that specific product. Um, I really like the, the green one at the bottom in the second row. Uh, cause yeah, I mean, you, you can see a bunch of different foods and like, and they just made it really self-explanatory. Like, oh, that looks nice. It's very visually appealing. And so you can see on the right, like on the right half, like the Ziploc one, they're just showing the packaging. Like that's, that's terrible. Like it doesn't like make me want to buy that product anymore. I mean, they're lucky they're a big brand, so that's helpful. But yeah, it's not super appealing. On the right, it's okay. It doesn't really have food. It's not like, you know, you just have black containers. I mean, I understand what the product does, but it doesn't really like help me visualize what it's going to be like when I own that product. But the top, the bottom two images, they've done it. Like they, they are basically making recommendations of what you can put in that product before you even buy it. And I think that's brilliant. That's what I would do. Then there's the secondary images. So here's some awesome examples. So on the left is that you're, you're getting like, you know, again, like added benefits. So they're showing you like a close up of the pattern. So in case you really want to see like the finer details, if you're that kind of person, you can see that in that little gold ring. Um, and again, it's showing you a model that's actually using it. You know, she's like fit. So it's like, oh yeah, like, you know, fit people buy these types of products. And overall, it's giving you a better explanation of how this product uh, works and why it's different, all that kind of stuff. And then on the right, this one's kind of featuring some more highlights and it's like, you know, that it's three times stronger than plastic cutlery, which is great, you know what I mean? And again, it has like a zoomed in photo. So you can see it like that it's like a thick product and it's giving you the dimensions. So in case you're, you're concerned about the product being too small, it's saying like, no, these are six and a half inches long, like all that kind of stuff. So you're basically, you're, uh, you're answering any possible questions that your customer could possibly have to increase the likelihood of a conversion. Okay, so keyword research. So this, to really understand this well, you need to understand the basics of the A9 algorithm. And so when you think about it, you know, Google is really a search engine specifically for information. And, you know, that's where like a ton of their traffic comes from. And what's amazing now is that Amazon has built such loyalty within consumers that it's really now the search engine for products. And so the reason that we uh, we share that is because, like I mentioned, uh, you know, much earlier in this video, is that when people come to Amazon, they have buying intent. They're shoppers. They're actually looking to make a purchase. And so what that means is that Amazon is trying to show you the most relevant items at the very top to help drive the most revenue for their company. And so what that means is they want like the uh, basically uh, they want the most successful products to be at the very very top, and so they pay attention to a lot of things like relevancy percentage to make sure that the keywords, and so they really pay attention to the uh, relevancy percentage to make sure that the most relevant products are shown at the very very top uh, for those specific keywords. And so what your job is, you want to ensure that your listing has the correct and relevant keywords distributed in the listing to make sure that you guys are listed at the very top for the keywords that you want to rank for. And then so you want to come up with a list of anywhere from like 100 to 150 keyword phrases to use in that listing specifically. Uh, there's some great tools out there like Zonwords and Seller Tools. Both of those will help you to actually uh, determine which keywords that you want to use in your listing. Okay, so copywriting. 
So you'll see a ton of listings and I'll show you some examples where the listing, like, you know, doesn't really do the best job. They just give you basically the bullets, you know, will give you kind of like, you know, the description of the product, you know, maybe like the UPC code or they'll give you the dimensions, but they don't really sell you the benefit. And that's why I, uh, really good copywriting is so, so important. And so what you want to do is one, maximize the exposure of your listing with traffic with, you know, really good keywords. And then, like I mentioned earlier, is that Amazon's going to score each listing uh, based on a relevancy score. And so you want to have the right keywords and then also copy that sells. And so there's a few things that you can do to affect your relevancy. One is repeating keywords. And then two is driving sales on those keywords. So either through giveaways, PPC, things like that. And then, you know, the higher the relevancy, the more targeted the traffic, which makes sense. So some copywriting elements. So just getting to get it out, but you know, a quick primer on what gets indexed. The title you have about 200 character limit, and and so for titles, you know, sometimes that does vary on category. Just so you guys know, bullets this also varies on category, but you'll you'll see when you get the limit. Product description you can have up to a thousand characters there. Uh, enhanced brand content is a really cool way to differentiate, but you'll see basically uh, really nice imagery in the middle of the listing where the product description usually goes. And this is a great way to do kind of side-by-side -side comparison, so, you know, include more lifestyle images here, a better description of the brand and the product. There's a lot of really great examples of this. And then you can also include the backend search terms where there's about 250 characters that are indexed. And then there's also the subject matter field, which adds 50 characters per line. So a lot of things that are not indexed just to make sure that we're all on the same page, the questions and answers are not indexed, reviews are not indexed. But yeah, overall, this is just a quick primer on this. And then some of the best like kind of keyword and copywriting tools uh, that we use in our business, we love Zonwords. And then we actually have some promo codes here for you guys. Seller tools as well is another great option. Has a ton of uh, Amazon data that's kind of pulled in there for both of these guys. Uh, Sonar tool is a good free version. It's definitely not as sophisticated, but it's you know a good option. And then Google Keyword Planner for sure as well. And then for copywriting tools, Seller Tools is really, really awesome. Again, Helium 10 does have the, the scribbles in, in Frankenstein uh, options. And then Text Mechanic is also another free one, just so that you guys are familiar. Okay, so I wanted to cover this a little bit uh, more in depth. So. Here is a example of a bad listing. So again, like the title is not really inspiring, doesn't really use good keywords. It's kind of like taking up a lot of room by the like, you know, 10 inch by 14 inch, just not necessarily the best way. Uh, and then again, the minimal copy, it's like, you know, you know, they didn't really, they mentioned made in USA, but they don't really like feature anything about, you know, the benefits of the product, why you would use the product, you know, all that good stuff. And then the last thing is that if you look on the left, there's, you know, very few images, no lifestyle images, nothing really that excites me about buying this product. Next, here's an awesome, the, the example of the food containers that we saw earlier, but this is a great listing. So the, the title and the bullets are both optimized. You know, the, the title uses a lot of uh, keywords that I think are important, like airtight, leak proof, uh, you know, easy snap lock, BPA free, all that kind of stuff is really important. They're very clear that it's an 18 piece set. Um, and then the, you know, the bullets, you know, again, using a lot of those same keywords and again, the benefits. So like some, one of the benefits is that it's uh, space savings or that it's, um, you know, FDA approved, all that kind of stuff that makes me feel more comfortable buying it. And then when you look at the images, again, they've got, you know, a lot of images of the product being used so that I can imagine myself personally using this product, which is, again, the ideal. Uh, that's pretty much it for the pre-launch phase. So that means that we've gotten a lot of our keywords and the photography and all that kind of stuff done. And then now the product has arrived in Amazon's FBA program and we're ready to launch. So launching your product. So so yeah, 80% of the clicks happen on the first page, which is super, super crucial to understand. So basically, if you're not on page one, the best you can do is get 20% of the clicks. So, and that's, you know, if you have all the real estate on pages two, three, four, five, six, um, which is very not likely. So you really want to be on page one. And so that's why we do um, a bunch of different giveaways and a bunch of different tactics to make sure that we're on that first page for the important keywords. And so the goal is to rank on page one for the best keywords. And that's, you know, dependent on 
you know, whichever ones get the highest impressions, but also the ones that have the highest relevancy. And so again, like relevancy is, you know, that when someone searches, you know, screen printing frame that like, you know, that's like the product that they were going to want to buy, you know, more frames. And then, so when you think about the A9 algorithm factors, there's a few different aspects. There's the performance. So what your sales velocity is, and then your relevance. So how well your product matches that specific search. So um, again, like there's just a lot of different ways that, you know, you can think about it. So like kind of going back to the food container example, uh, you know, you could find glass ones, you can find plastic ones, you can find circle ones, you can find square ones. And so there's a lot of different um, factors that can be included in relevancy. And so Amazon has, you know, some crazy robots that figure out how to do that. So ranking your product. So again, going a little bit further into the A9 algorithm. So you're looking at your uh, sales velocity and then your relevance. And then, so the best ways to do that um, are through, like I mentioned, PPC. So every time you get a sale on a keyword through PPC, it gets registered and then also giveaways. So this can be both full price giveaways and highly discounted giveaways. So some people will do like 90% off discount codes um, and give a bunch of units away like that way. There's other tools that you can use like Rebate where you get like a full a full price giveaway and then you actually refund them afterwards. So those are both strategies to do in terms of product launches. And then there's also uh, super URLs. So this is a cool, really brilliant way that basically kind of mimics a customer searching for a specific product using a keyword. So like, again, going back to the screen printing frame, it kind of gives them a link and then it basically gives the impression that the customer actually searched you know, screen printing frame. And then it tries to give you credit for that on that specific purchase. So PBC. So this is a fantastic way, again, to drive that initial visibility for listings. And then the great thing is that a lot of the time it's profitable. So you want to bid to rank on page one for the most competitive keywords possible. Uh, conversions through PPC increase, again, that sales velocity, uh, which helps you rank. And then understanding like PPC is really, really crucial to maximizing your Amazon success. So I cannot emphasize that enough. It's a huge part of the business. We spend approximately around 70 grand per month on PPC. It ends up being profitable for us and drives us a ton of sales. So, you know, just to give you guys a quick understanding. So you can see at the top, there's kind of the sponsored products. And this is kind of like, you know, what used to be referred to as a AMS, but I know they're, they're going through a lot of transition right now and kind of merging it. But the cool thing, like Hydroflask is, yeah, a beautiful listing here. It shows, highlights all the different colors. You do need a minimum of three listings to be up here in that kind of headline search ad. And then at the bottom, there's also more uh, specific like sponsored products, uh, you know, listings being marketed. You can see that um, at the top, these three kind of listings, the, the purple one, like the simple modern cast and uh, D Amazon. Um, and then, so yeah, those are being paid to be at the top. And then there's also the right search bar as well, which is like kind of the JMP home, uh, and JK 21 ounce. So those are usually the most common places that you can see sponsored product, sponsor products being. So the next section is the post launch module. So for post launch optimization, this is one of the most important formulas that I really want you guys to remember is that sales equals traffic times conversion rate which makes sense, right? So traffic is really the number of sessions that you're getting. Conversion is your conversion rate. And then so if you get, let's say for example, 100 sessions, you have a 25% conversion rate. That means, you know, for simple math, you should get 25 sales. And so, you know, the, the idea is that this is how you guys get, uh, if you increase your sales, you get a better rank and then overall, uh, it, it just benefits. So increasing your traffic. So this is the post launch. So the goal is to get increase the amount of clicks that you get on your listing. So again, like the session. And then, so the best ways that we can affect traffic is one is testing. So it could be testing your images and then also improving your keyword indexing. So one of my favorite tools for testing the main image is Splitly. So we're constantly running a bunch of different tests with that. And um, it's been really, really helpful in terms of making sure that we're choosing the best image and putting our best foot forward. So then number two is paying for traffic, again, using Amazon sponsored products, so PPC. And then number three is testing different pricing. 
So just kind of seeing where you stack up against your competitors and then seeing you know what the optimal price is. Again, Splitly has a great tool for this. So, um, and then in terms of increasing your conversions, you know, post-launch, so the goal is to improve your conversion rate. Um, so like, if, again, if you have 100 people coming to your listing, if 25% uh, convert, that's a great metric. And so everything that you can do to your listing uh, to increase the likelihood of purchase is time really well spent. So uh, the target like for conversion rate is for, like at the minimum, like kind of like, yeah, 13 to 15%. Uh, a lot of our listings, like I mentioned, are in the 25 to 30%. But you know, the more competitive the category, most likely the lower your conversion rate is going to be. Uh, the more comparables that you have to your listing, also the lower it's going to be. And then, so a few of the things that we can do to really improve your conversion rate is again, those, uh, those secondary images, making sure that they have, they're really well described. And then like, you know, that you can actually sell the product through the images. I think that's really big. Enhanced brand content definitely, at least for us, has really helped us in terms of increasing the conversion rate and then running coupon codes. You know, uh, you know, people can be cheap. And so they, a lot of the time they want to make sure that they feel like they're getting a good deal. So, uh, Coupon codes is a really effective way. Um, so I can show you guys this. So um, this is something that was added pretty recently uh, within Seller Central, but you can basically create um, you know extra coupon codes uh, that show up on your listing or you know show up in the search results. It's a great way to drive people to your listing, but and then again um, help you increase that conversion rate once people are actually there. And it's super easy to redeem um, things like that. And then you can see in this slide as well, uh, you know, the really strong use uh, in the middle of like secondary images, uh, which looks really great. And then it kind of has these, the, the, it encourages people to buy more, which I love, like kind of these, um, these bundle coupon codes. And then the last one on the right is a cool example of some enhanced brand content that was set up by old school labs. You know, just a quick bonus section, but Amazon sponsored products. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to cover this one really, really quickly for you guys. Uh, since there's just so much to cover, but uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of this is uh, again uh, showing you a, a quick screenshot of you know where sponsored products show up on the search results, and so how do you measure your PPC effectiveness? And so this is a really tough one. There's a lot of schools of thought, uh, but overall, what we do is we do the average cost of sale metric, which is the ACOS. So, for example, if you have a twenty dollar retail product. And it, let's say it costs three dollars in pay per click to generate one conversion. Then you would take the three dollars, you divide it by twenty dollars, and then you end up with fifteen percent. So it costs you basically fifteen percent of your product price to generate one sale. And then, so what you're looking at is to make sure that your ACOS is ideally less than your gross margin. So let's say, like, you know, kind of going back to the example that we were using earlier i mean actually those were really high percentages but you know so if your gross margin is 25 percent and your acos is 15 percent then overall you're doing great in terms of your ppc and then so acos is definitely the key metric for uh that we use when measuring your ppc efficiency and then so this is kind of like the kind of campaign process, you know, very, very simplified. Um, but basically what you want to do is you want to add keywords to your campaign. You want to increase, decrease bids based on how effective they are in terms of creating conversions. And, you know, again, monitoring that through your ACOS. And then you use your Amazon reports uh, to mine um, keywords. We go through this way further in depth in our training program, but just to kind of to give you guys a quick high level of what we're doing. And there you go. So that covers basically everything, you know, from A to Z of how to create an Amazon business in 2018. And so hopefully that was helpful for you guys. And yeah, thanks so much for listening.